on Saturday, the 3rd of June, we're having our famous Word in the Park in the splendid surroundings of Holland Park, Kensington. Our guests that day include Bob Stanley, who'll be talking about the Bee Gees, Leslie Ann Jones, whose specialist subject is the Rolling Stones, and John Higgs, who will be explaining what the Beatles and James Bond tell us about the British psyche. Your hosts will be me, David Hepworth and Mark Ellen. There will be a canopy over your head. There are cold drinks and spectacular lavatories. It starts at 2 and finishes at 4.30. Get your tickets here. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic. Well, it's been amazingly 46 years now since he unforgettably fell off a load of amplifiers <laughs> live on the old grey whistle test. I can still see it now. And it's been 50 years since he first went on the road with Wild Willie Bar- Barrett. Hence, they are about to step out on their wonderfully named Last Straw Tour in <laughs> April. It's lovely to see you. John Otway, how are you? Fine. No, no, very, very, very good. Um, I mean, last year I did, I did my 5,000th gig and I had my 70th birthday. No shame there. No. I know. You're among and, friends. <laughs> I know, I, I, I've watched a few of your um, other episodes and it just made me re- realise just how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here to do. You. That's what we're here thing. to do, to remind people of how old they are. And make them feel better. <laughs> make them feel among friends. Exactly. <laughs> so where, where are you? Where are we talking to you? Um, I'm in London, in Wandsworth. All right, excellent. Oh, not far from me, in fact. So, John, where we normally start with these things is we go back to the the childhood home and the record-playing equipment that you remember at the time. Can you remember what what you used to play records on when you were when you were very young? Now, now the, 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 this um, I, I realised you were going to ask me that, and so I thought back, and I realised that the first thing I ever learned I ever played records on at home was a record player that I built from Meccano. Whoa! God, that's, that's a first. Incredible. Because with the old seventy-eight records, yeah, if you put them on, and I've got, I've got a demonstration here. If you actually made a cone like this, yeah, and turned the records, the, the seventy-eight records around, you could actually play them. <laughs> that's fantastic. Is that a wood? What is that at the end? A cocktail stick or something? Uh, um, no, no, it's a needle. It's a needle. It's a needle. Yeah, yeah, that's what you used to do. Put a needle yeah. in, in the end of the cone and then turn the, turn the record round. <laughs> and, and you could play it. <laughs> what did you play and, on it? Um, and I mean, if, when it comes to buying my, my first record, the first record I bought would have been um, a 78 because my mum used to. Um, when Jumbo sells the Red Cross and the St. John's. Uh, yeah. And um, at that time, everybody was replacing their shellac, shellac with vinyl. Yeah. Right. And they were throwing out all their old shellac albums and, or, 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 or 78 records. So my first, you know, would, would have been a pile of those that I bought from a, a Jumbo sale. Can you remember the titles of any of them? Um... No, um, it's a lot of dance band. It was a lot of dance band dance music. Dance band, right. early rock and roll, very early rock and roll, possibly. No, 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 no early rock and roll. Band. Nobody was throwing that out. Right, no, no I suppose <laughs> not. I suppose <laughs> not. So where were you living at the time? Aylesbury, right. Buckinghamshire. Right. What was the first record shop you used to go to? Can you remember that? Um, it was a record centre record centre in Aylesbury. Right. And... Um, Years later, Dave Stops, who used to run Friars, um, had a had a record shop in um in, in a town centre, which is where I used to get a lot of the stuff from. Can is you he... remember what the first record was that you bought? Um well when we got when we got a, a vinyl record, <laughs> um the first one I bought was a Rhythm of the Rain, the Cascades. Oh right. Because I'll tell you then this did make me feel old, it was the fact that I started listening. Get, really getting into music when I was um, when I was eight years old in 1960, and I was checking up on on, on that be, uh, before we did this, um, and I can remember you know Pick of the Pops, Alan Freeman, and I can remember a lot of the early you know the Cliff Richard stuff, um, and uh, you know um, My Man's a Dustman. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, long, you know, long, absolutely. That dates back to you know, that dates back to 1960. Well, and, you're talking about um, the 50s, aren't you, actually? You're talking about 58? I don't... Yeah. You're talking about the 50s, actually. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, um, I was born fifty two, so I was. So it was basically that that year, nineteen sixty, when yeah. I started getting into. Um, when I started really get seriously getting into. Yeah, music. yeah. So I'm, a, you know, one of the few, one of the few people that really remembers what music was like before the Beatles, <laughs> and actually remembering, you know, that revolution, which which it was. I mean, it was astonishing. Yeah. And I mean, it, I, it was really, really exciting. Um, you know, I was um, so was so, I um, eleven then, wasn't I? Yeah. So did you start playing music? When did you start playing music and performing? Uh, my mum wouldn't let me have a guitar. She had suspicions of what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to do, but I was allowed to learn a violin. Oh. So I took violin lessons, and I was very good. I practiced like forty minutes a night every night for sort of like six years. I wasn't very good, but I did get in the Aylesbury Youth Orchestra. But it did mean that when I got a guitar, I could actually learn one quite quickly. Right. So her suspicions were that you would be going to become a, a, a tear-away rock and roller, presumably. Squander well, their Willie life. Barrett, Wild Willie Barrett, um, who ended up um, working with me, um, used to uh, stroll up and down the road with a guitar over his shoulder. And my mum used to say, uh, look, if you get a guitar, you're going to end up like Willie Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> she must have been thrilled when the two of you got together. Oh, abs- absolutely <laughs> delighted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So what was the first group you were in? Um oh it will be um it will be the John Otway band. <laughs> oh, well, that's simple Very enough. Good. Yeah. Well, nobody, nobody nobody would work with me basically. Um, I, I was a bit of a um bit of an oddity. It wasn't, you know. Um nobody would invited me to uh, to join their band. There were school bands, but I was never allowed to be in them. So you were kind of an outsider, were you? Yes, yes. Is that because you would you wouldn't play the songs that they wanted to play, or did you always do your own stuff, or what? I couldn't play the songs. I oh, it's but the reason, one of the reasons I started writing songs was um, if I wrote the song, I could play. It. <laughs> so the John Otway band wasn't doing covers; they were doing self-penned classics. Yeah, there was um, a couple of things. Um, a lot of. Um, the first things I started doing was um, uh, basically a lot of Bob Dylan. I mean, I was a huge, huge Bob Dylan fan. Um, it was quite interesting. I've got a few books um, on my shelf there. And I was just going through them, thinking about what I was going to say to you. And I realised that an astonishing... Um, wow. Lots of, them. of them are all Bob Dylan books. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's funny, I remember... Um, you know, go back to sort of like uh, 63, 64. Um, my sister, one of my sisters had a, a Roy Orbison record and the other had a Bob Dylan record. And I remember liking them both and wondering if it, you could actually like both of them. Because, yes, uh, you can. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, I was only sort of 12, 12 or 13 and I did wonder whether it was, you know, it was cool to like them both. And then I did think, you know, few, you know, many, many years later, wasn't it weird that they ended up in a band together? The same group. Yeah, there I you know. go. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Amazing. Perfect. I remember one thing about the, the early record player was because I I'd only ever listened to uh, music on the radio, uh, Pick of the Pops, which I, I and I used to listen to the radio avidly. And then when we did get a record player, I remember the shock of listening to uncompressed music and listening to a listening to a Beatles record and hearing it on a record player rather right. than on the radio. Yeah. Um, with the sound opened out. I remember that vividly. What yes, with all the bass and stuff. Well, because all yeah. the old radio yeah. was AM in those days. It was, it was medium wave, you know. That's, that's right. And that's it was really terribly, terribly compressed. Yeah. But when you actually heard a record on, on a record player, it just it opened out. It was amazing. Yeah. Have you got any of your early records there, the things that you bought? Have you still got those things? No, um, I mean, I, don't, I think the problem you get. I've, actually, I've got, I've, I've got a, 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 a few early ones I managed to hang on to, but when you have disastrous relationships that don't end up, you know, in a very good way, um, one of the horrid things that they can do is take all your records away. Really? So yeah. this has happened to you on more than one occasion. <laughs> You've been turned right, out. Right. Well, you can say that. I, I, th- that's a negative side if you lose your records. Yeah, yeah. But the positive side of it, you get to write the songs. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. You yeah. take your revenge in songs. But you've... Uh, so what, what are the records that you left behind? Yes, well, what are the ones you most regret? 
losing. A couple of interesting things. Uh, when I was at school, um, one of the first things that got, got into um, got into is a pre, um, what, oh, what, wheels on fire. And another thing, can you remember these? Not many people mentioned them, but I had a huge effect on me. Um, the samplers. Oh, oh absolutely. Gosh. Nice, nice enough, enough to eat. And the rock machine, the machine turns, you turns you on. Well, nice yeah. enough to eat was how I first discovered, I think, Fairport Convention and Traffic and Nick Drake. First time I heard Nick Drake. Yeah. And amazingly for me, it was a Mott the Hoople. Yeah. And that right. was one of the first bands I ever saw at um, uh, Dave Stops that had a club yeah, called Friars. Friars. Yeah. 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 The greatest acts uh, in, in the world played there, like David Bowie and, and Queen and, and everything. And um, one of the first acts I saw was Mott the Hoople. And um, I mean, they were absolutely staggering. staggering. So nice yeah. enough to eat. Here's a trivia question for the two of you. How much did it cost? I noticed your copy didn't have a sticker on the on on on, on the front, John. Oh, mean, or maybe it does. No, um, no. Oh, my copy has a sticker, and I. I've obviously, but I've obviously picked this one up from somewhere else. It's got eight somewhere else. On it. <laughs> Was okay. it thirteen shillings it's and six? Fourteen and six. Fourteen and six. Fourteen and six. That which amazing? is is less than seventy five p, isn't it? It is. Isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. What a great record. No, those records were huge. Fill your head with rock gut bucket. They were wonderful. Because yeah, people couldn't afford to buy LPs, you know. So, I mean, if you look at those things like Rock Machine Turns You On, so many of those groups became huge because everybody had bought the album, bought, yeah. bought the sampler, Santana and Blood, Sweat and Tears and all that kind of stuff. No, um, as you say, I mean, they, they got you into um, uh, got you into certain acts, got me into certain acts as well. I mean, especially the Island one, because that Island was such a, um, I mean, such, such an amazing label, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's quite definitely. fantastic. So you were was, left um, with you were left with those albums. So they, uh, they, they, you know, your former, your former <laughs> girlfriend, whatever. Uh, Went off with everything else, but left behind the sample. Oh, yeah. oh, I love that. So, did she yeah. deliberately say, "I'm not taking. I don't need I'm these." Don't take don't <laughs> There's a couple of I do need teaser and the fire cat by Cat Stevens. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Uh, what did she take that you you really you really missed? Can you remember anything that you were very fond of? Um. Well, my Bob Dylan albums. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh really? Oh good God, that's below the belt. That is. <laughs> and all of them, I've, I've actually, I've actually managed to rescue one of them. So, right. So, we were talking about, as Mark referred to it in, in the intro. You know, it's however many years since your legendary appearance on the on the whistle test. And I thought, well, I've got, I've got to refresh my memory about this because I, I have a kind of raw memory of seeing it at the time. Um, and it, it kind of, of course, it's there on YouTube, like everything's there on YouTube forevermore. It is an extraordinary, unique television event, isn't it, John? And it, 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 it's amazing. I mean, it is, or, or it was, like overnight stardom. That's completely. Um, and what was supposed to happen was I was supposed to run and leap on top of Willie's amplifier and have these re reverb Rings at the top of the amplifier. So if you jumped up and down on them, you got a nice crashing sound. But I slipped, and one leg went one side of the amplifier, and um, I landed on my testicles. Um, this you know, clip is still half, visible. Five and a half million people watched it. And Was that what they talked about? Really? Yeah. It looks I mean, I mean, so I, I, painful. I, 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 I'll just show you this. I actually made a flicker book of the mo of, of that moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, yeah, but, it, but it was astonishing. I mean, we were playing some 50 people a night in a pub. That went on television. And the next night, there was a queue down the block. And within um, within a month, we were on top of the pops. And, yeah, I was a pop star. So, so the, the, thing, the thing that struck me, you were looking at it. I mean, you're on whistle test. Who booked you? But it's Mike Appleton booked you. Yeah, Mike Appleton booked us. Uh, uh, why, why did he book you? I mean, did he seen you or? Yeah, we um, th there was a club called the the Speakeasy in Margaret Street. Right, yeah, yeah. Which yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, uh, yeah, that was just around the corner from um, broadcasting, broadcasting house. house yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like the producer down there, and um, we had we had a residency there, and we were picking up, um, you know, quite quite a big following. It was sort of like the uh, it was the the year of punk rock. 
um, the Sex Pistols had, had just broken yeah. through. And what we were doing on stage was, um, you know, had elements to it, um, you know, like being shocking and playing badly, which um, I've been doing for years. But <laughs> <laughs> so The thing I couldn't believe when I looked at it, though, is you play for quite a long time. It's quite a long number, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The, the, and it's right at the end of the show, and it's live, presumably. I mean, it, was that going out live, or was it recorded earlier in the evening? It was actually out? recorded. It was actually recorded. It was actually recorded the day before. Oh right, okay. Oh, I, I did actually manage to get a load of people in the pub the next night. So, like, what? Watch me do it. Oh really? Because this, <clears throat> this is presumably the days before video recorders. You know, no, no, just at the, um, just at that, uh, just no, at, well, about that that time. Um, uh, there was a big old Phillips ones. I, I, I um, yes, <laughs> big old Phillips. Uh, but it's gen- still, generally speaking, if something was on the whistle test, you know, everybody saw it because they had to catch it once. They didn't had they? to you know? see it; they couldn't miss it. And it stayed in their, it stayed in their mind more strongly than it would have done if it happened ten years ago, or whatever. Because that's the way you watch TV in those days. There was a great intensity about it, wasn't there? Yes, and but you do. I mean, you do remember uh, have, and have stronger memories of things that happen. That you know, yeah. in, in your sort of um, you know, uh, 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 early teens to sort of like um, early twenties. You always remember those things, uh, yeah, <laughs> really well. I mean, it, I mean, it was an astonishing piece of good luck because what could have happened was the camera could have been pointing at, at Willie and not at me. Completely. <laughs> more li- more likely than not, really. It's incredible good fortune. <laughs> was that something you used to do in the act every night then and it had never actually fallen off the, the amps? Oh, I mean, I, I, the, um, the, show was, uh, the show was really quite physical. I, I mean... I, I had things that I built. To, I, I I couldn't tightrope what we for one tour we built two scaffolding towers and I was sort of, uh, with a bar across the top and I would go ac- across the top of the drum kit, which is very frightening. So the, the yeah, and um, you know, things that hang hang off them from one legs, uh, you know. And um, I mean, uh, yes, I mean I was uh, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but you but you're better than that now, John, aren't you? You've calmed down, presumably. <laughs> What well, people- I, um, I did do um, I did do a tour called Somersaults at sixty, but I was still doing somersaults with the guitar. Oh, and, yeah. um, and on my um, call, baby, I'm an OAP gig came up <laughs> at sixty five. I was still doing it, but the problem was lockdown really because I stopped doing a lot of that physical stuff during lockdown. And you know, if you're nervous about doing something, you're likely to hurt yourself. Yeah, um, and so I, I've I've stopped diving off step ladders now. <laughs> So you've had lots of really original ideas. One, one was to produce a record. I did a version of, of The House of the Rising Sun, and I think you credited all the people. It was kind of crowdfunded, wasn't it? I think all the yeah. people who, who'd, who'd contributed to its recording got their name on the back of the That was a very original idea. Yes, well, we, we, were, we had a big campaign to uh, have, have, have another hit 25 years after my yeah. first one, on my 50th birthday. And we kept thinking of ways we could sell extra records. And one of the ways we booked Abbey Road Studios and invited any because people used to heckle during House of the Rising Sun and invited anyone that wanted to heckle. So we had about a, a, a thousand hecklers to, to Abbey Road Studios and by credited all th- a thousand of them. I mean, it turns out, you know, if you're credited as an artist, you know, on a big hit record, you're going to buy one more copy for yourself and yeah. a copy for your mum, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. You, you will definitely do that. I have to yeah. say for anybody anybody listening who doesn't know that John invented this fantastic kind of call and response version of The House of the Rising Sun, which I've seen you do at festivals. It's so funny. It's kind of, there is what a house where in New Orleans. What's it called? <laughs> and it is just... It's so funny. There's a brilliant bit where you say, the only thing a gambler needs is a suitcase and a trunk, and they go, that's two things. Yeah. <laughs> on the other one, they say, and God, I know, and the whole audience just, who's a prat? <laughs> who's a prat? <laughs> I'm one. Who did you, where did you get that idea from? Just from from just doing the gigs that people were heckling? Yeah, I think so. I can't remember when people started heckling. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's years ago we did, um, we're doing it, and then... Um, and then he just when we were thinking about uh, um, things to help um, help me have a hit, uh, the idea of recording it at Abbey Road came up. Yeah, 
It's a fantastic idea. So funny. So, so the did, did, the very first things you did with Wild Willie Barrett, what did that consist of? Um, well, it's, it's great, Jackson. Willie was um, Willie was basically a blues and bluegrass player. Really, yeah. I mean, he's a multi instrumentalist, a really good fiddle player, really good banjo player. Plays style, uh, and he had his own, he had his own folk club. Um, and I went up there and um, half cleared the audience. But I mean, it, I mean, Willie was quite sort of amused by it. So you know, I, I was allowed to do a, you know a couple of numbers um, every so often. And um, when I, um, I basically booked a, booked a recording studio and asked Willie if he'd come and um, play, all, you, know, you know, do uh, do a song with me. And then I did something which was completely unusual at that time. Is I pressed off my own record because I, I had a, an instinct that was probably right that I would never be able to get a record contract. <laughs> so I pressed off my own record and. And this is absolutely wonderful. I'm John Peel. I started playing on on Radio One, and John Peel was wonderful for that. I mean, he, I mean, almost you know every artist from sort of my age on was, you know, thanks John Peel for sort of giving him a break. Yeah. yeah. And then um, then um, Pete Townsend um, um, liked the record and um, um, and produced and uh, um, produced a version for us. So that was sort of like the start of a uh, Otway and Barrett. I think Willie would have preferred not to work with me, but the problem was we, you know, the rewards tended to be too great when we did. Yes. Can I, I, Why I would he even we, prefer not to work with you? <laughs> what? We, we quite like each other now, which is quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you can't, I mean, do you, do you have any, well, you clearly don't have any resentment about the fact that you're, you're still, I mean, most artists feel that they're kind of tethered to something that was their first hit or something like that, you know. They always have to play it. But you, you're you not resentful of that at all, are you? No, 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 no. You, 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 I mean, think, think about life without any hits at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, that's yeah. the case for most artists, isn't it? it? Is. Really, you know. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky I've had two. I mean... um, I mean, the, the great thing for me was actually it, it took 25 years, but actually getting another hit. And then you could say, no, I've, I've had a chart career that spans 25 years. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, so, so, so get, you know, getting, um, getting the second hit was, uh, was wonderful. Right. And, and I've always started. I mean, pretty much every gig I've done, I've started with my first hit. Right. And then on the B-side of my hit, which was a song called Beware of the Flowers, um, which, funnily enough, got voted the uh, nation's seventh favourite lyric um, by the BBC in, um, in the two, year 2000. So who comes, who comes to see you when you play? Um, oh, wait, fans. I mean, we, I've been quite good at keeping... Um, you know, keep keeping the you know keeping the audience to get you know keeping the audience together. Um, I've always referred to um, what I do as a micro stardom. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. is stardom. It's not not very big, but it is stardom. It's, it's, yeah. And um, yeah, we, we do. Um, I don't like. We used to do um, things like Dunkirk trips, and we take five coach loads of uh, fans over to Dunkirk um, every day. We did that for thirteen years. And well, you very nearly hired an aeroplane and took people on tour that, well, yes we, that, that just went disastrously wrong after it never happened in the end but it seems such a brilliant idea why did it never happen um i i basically um there is that sort of thing where people say you know when you bite off more than you can chew do you know what i mean and yeah that, yeah and it's you, you know, just because you had another hit record doesn't mean you can charter a seven four seven and fly around the world and play. Um, you know, well, it's going to be a seven four seven. That is, that's a huge aircraft. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, yeah, yeah. I know now. <laughs> yes, I know now, now, now. You tell me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was well, such, a, such a, an ouch and such a painful ouch. And now it would have been all right because you'd have just crowdfunded it yes. and if you hadn't quite got the numbers then it wouldn't have happened that's right um, whereas before before crowdfunding like that you you know if you didn't quite get the number you know numbers all the money went down the pan <laughs> yes yeah yeah do you have a manager or do you do you handle your own your own career um, no, i've got um 
I, I embark on projects and I'm, I'm, I'm quite good at, um, I'm quite good at, you know, getting people to sort of like play along with them, you know, and um, the last album we did, we recorded in Montserrat in the Caribbean because that, that, that was a cool place to record. I'm going to say. <laughs> and, uh, and then 50 bands came over there to sort of sing backing vocalists as well. Um, but that was great. So I had, you know, I got, um, you know, go, go, you know, go, a guy called Richard Cotton who'd done, um, you know, Gig 2000 and he'd um, organised a hit campaign and um, I got him into a, you know, org- organised going over to, a, to um, get the band over to Montserrat. Right. Because what was good about doing the Montserrat thing was it, it was like recording in the way that um, people people used to record because we, the band were only there for two weeks and wanted to record it in two weeks. Everybody learnt their parts. Everybody knew what they were doing. So it was all done live then pretty, pretty much? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the whole rhythm set, everybody sitting yeah. around the rhythm section with a guide vocal on and, um, you know, but everybody knew the parts. You, you weren't really doing any writing in the studio. Yeah. Um, so what can people look forward to in your, your upcoming tour? What, what's the title of this tour? Does it yeah, have the, a title? The, 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 the last it's, it's tour tour, isn't it? Oh, yes. 50 years of what we're about, half a century. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. And what, it's what, I, um, I, I googled. I, I thought the idea half a century. And I asked somebody must have used it, and all I could find was a, a couple of Christmas cards, uh, a couple of birthday cards with it on, but nobody had used it for the tour. Because you know, when a lot of bands, you know, or, or, or artists, when they get to my age and they're doing their fiftieth anniversary, all the posters are just a load of old guys on, you know, and they all look terrible and old. <laughs> but half a century, I, 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 you know, doesn't uh, convey something a bit different. <laughs> And what can people expect then? Um, it- oh, it's not my Barrett show. So um, I did do an album. Um, now, how, how long ago was it? About uh, fifteen years ago, called "The Set Remains the Same." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and the great thing about that, uh, the great thing about that album is it's still current. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's very good. That's very good. Well, look, the way we traditionally wind up these chats is go by. Getting people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made is that something that you have views on, John? Yes, I mean it, it was difficult. I mean it was difficult for me because it had it, it really. Um, I really had, had to say, um, I had to tear myself away from it not being Bob Dylan. Um, There's no reason why it can't be Bob Dylan. It would have probably been. Um, it would have probably been um, Highway 61 Revisited or Blood on the Tracks, but I ended up going for... Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, very good. That's an old copy as well. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I remember, you know, when, when that came out, we just, just used to play, just used to, uh, me and some mates just used to play it endlessly over and over and over again. Absolutely. And, I remember my sister's friend had a really, really good um, set of headphones, a very, very expensive um, record player. I remember, I remember just sort of like going round there and just sort of like li- li- listening to it, uh, listening to Madame George ten times in a row. Absolutely, didn't we all? Didn't we all? We did absolutely. Well, we used to go into record shops and get people. We couldn't afford to buy. We used to go in and sit in the little listening booths and get them. To oh buy right! Buy oh, you are old. You are old. Oh God, yeah, no, <laughs> no, we're all the same old. age as you. We're all. You're among friends. Don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. So half a century coming to a town near you. Um, thanks very much for uh, talking to us, John. It's been it's been fun. <laughs>